John chapter number 18 is where we are headed. To give you a little bit of background and to remind you a little bit about where we've been over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the life of Christ and, and the book of John and focusing on Jesus. And He's been telling us again and again of who He is, reminding us that He is God. And so uh, we are looking this morning at John chapter number 18. And we are uh, going to be starting here in just a moment. Verse number 12 is where we'll be getting to in just a minute. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever seen someone take something valuable and misuse it or perhaps even refuse it? Something that's very valuable, but they either misuse it, they're not appropriately using it, or, or they just absolutely refuse it altogether. How many of you this morning, how many of you have ever been rock climbing before? Anybody this morning? Okay. Uh, some of you? Okay. Um, they have there at Pensacola, they had, uh, uh, they've got a huge rock climbing wall, and some of the kids got to enjoy that this last week and go rock climbing uh, there. And, and rock climbing can be a, a lot of fun. And uh, we had our family down there, and, and, and Grayson wanted to go rock climbing. And uh, for those of you that are watching or for those of you that are here, Grayson's almost four years old and he's just go, go, go. So he was ready to go rock climbing and he wanted to go and uh, they, they allowed him uh, to, to put on this little harness and everything and he got his harness on and he was so excited and he was ready to go and he wanted to take off and go out there and he wanted to get out there to the rock and he wanted to go climb and, and uh, uh, they've got several different areas and several different places that you can go to and he was pointing to one rock and uh, I said, no, you can't go over there, we're going to go over here. And, and so we went over there and, and, and they have the safety harness that you're, ta that you're in but then they've got the safety rope that you attach on to. And while you're climbing, if you fall, that rope will catch you and keep you from falling and breaking your neck. And so uh, he wanted to start climbing. And I said, buddy, I said, you got to attach to this rope first. You got to let him attach this to it. And he goes, no, 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 I just want to climb. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, I don't know exactly how high it is, but it's like, you know, four stories or something high. You know, and he's just like, I just want to climb. And I'm like, no, no, you've got to get attached to the rope. And he's like, but I don't want the rope, you know, for a minute. And he just, he didn't want the rope. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't understand. He just wanted to climb. And I'm trying to explain to him, no, you've got to get attached to the rope first. And so he gets attached to the rope, and then he starts climbing, and he gets to about this high. I'm standing there next to him, and he gets to about this high, and then he just goes, <laughs> and he just, he just slides, and, and the rope just, yeah, and he goes, I want to climb again. And I'm like, okay. He's like, here I go. And he like gets up, and he gets up to about this high, and he just goes, <laughs> and he just wants to jump up and he just wants to swing on the rope. That's all he wanted to do after he got up there and he realized the purpose of the rope. All he wanted to do was to keep climbing and jumping down from about five, six feet and just jump down and hang on to the rope and just wee go down and, and hit the floor and hit the rubber mat. That's all he wanted to do. The point was, though, he, he didn't want the rope. Hey, I just want to climb, I just want to go, I just want to do. And no, 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 listen, you've got to have the rope. The rope is what will save you. The rope is the thing that will save you. So what he didn't understand was the necessity of the rope. I want you to go with me in, in John chapter number 18 this morning. We're going to read a few verses. Follow along with me. Beginning in verse number 12, the Bible says, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Remember last time we dropped off with them coming to arrest Jesus. Now that's what they're doing and they're taking him away. Verse 14, the Bible says, Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Jump down to verse number 19. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. Look down to verse number 24. The Bible says, Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. 
Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. We won't go into that. We've talked at length already at Peter's denial of Christ. But this is the context of everything that's going on right now. Verse number 28, the Bible says, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. The question for you this morning comes in the form of the title of the message, and it's simply this. What will you do with the king? What will you do with the king? This morning as we go through this passage, we're going to look and we're going to see a number of different people that were involved in the life of Christ here at His trial and at His crucifixion. And the question comes to us this morning, what did they do with the king? But in return, what will you do with the king? What have you done with Jesus? The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter number 6 in verses 13 through 15, uh, Paul's writing here to Timothy and he says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. He goes on to say that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. See, there's coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to return and he is going to identify himself as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Paul writes, he says, he gave a good confession of that when he was before Pilate. He, he said who he was. He told him that, yes, he was a king. And yes, his purpose of coming was to bear truth. And yes, his kingdom was not of this world. And there's coming a day when he is going to come back. And he will set up an earthly kingdom. Kingdom, and he will rule and reign and he will come not as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He came as that already. One day he's returning as the lion out of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back and he's going to come back one day and he's going to rule and reign. And the question at that day or the question when you die from this earth and you meet the Lord, the question is not going to be what church did you go to? The question is not going to be how many good things did you do? The question is not going to be what accomplishments can be attributed to you in your life. What is the greatest thing that you did while you were on the earth? That won't be the question. The question is going to be, what did you do with the king? What have you done with Jesus? The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter number 5, verses 11 through 13, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 
See, what is important this morning is that you know what you've done with Jesus. Do you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? Has there been a time where you've called upon the Lord to save you? Has there been a time in your life where you have received Christ as your Savior and you know that you have the Son? You know that you have Jesus in your life? Do you know that? We're going to look at some people this morning and we're going to see what they did with Jesus. The ultimate question, though, is what will you do with Jesus? Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll jump right into the message. Father, Lord, I want to thank you this morning for who you are. Lord, I pray this morning that you would use our time together. I pray that you'd use this message. I pray that you'd use me this morning. I pray that you'd give me strength. I pray that you'd give me power, Lord, this morning. Lord, I pray that your word would go forth and that if there's someone here this morning, Lord, they don't know Jesus Christ. They've never trusted you as their Savior. Lord, I pray this morning that you would speak directly to their heart. I pray that you'd show them their need of a Savior this morning. I pray they would see their sin that you died for. And I pray they might see this morning that they need eternal life through Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would be with this time now. Save those that need to be saved. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want you to go back with me now as we begin to work our way through this passage. And we read quite a few verses as we're going through, but I want to hone in on just a few here. Jesus is, is being taken away and he's been taken captive at this point in time. They came in the garden, they took him away. And then the Bible tells us that um, as he's being taken away, he's taken away to the high priest. And uh, if, you, if you know how the Jewish system worked at that day, there was a group of uh, 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 from, of the priests and of the different ones there, Pharisees and Sadducees, that, that formed this group that was called the Sanhedrin. They were kind of the governing rule over the Jewish people. And he was brought before them for a trial. And I want you to see that there are a few different responses here in this passage and in other passages as well that we'll look at. The first response that we're going to see here is a religious response. There was a religious response to Jesus Christ. He had said who he was. He had told them again and again. And the Jewish people, by and large, the Jewish people, and especially the religious people of his day, had rejected him again and again and again. They had pushed back at Jesus. They had pushed back at him saying that he was from God. They had pushed back at him saying he was the Son of God. They had pushed back at his teachings. They had pushed back at his works. They had pushed back on everything he had done. And now here we come, and it's time for, uh, uh, for his trial and for the crucifixion and everything. And we see a religious response from the religious elites of his day. Notice that there was a religious response here. And part of the reason for the way that they responded was that they were filled with envy towards Jesus. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 18 that he knew, Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered him. They were jealous of Christ. As a matter of fact, in John, earlier in the book of John, they said something, and I'm not quoting this word for word here, but the just of the passage is they say, the whole world is going to go after him and going to follow him if we don't do something about it. They were jealous of those that were following the Lord. They were envious of those who were going after Jesus. And they said, we have got to do something about it. And because they were so filled with envy, there was, their response was, let's get rid of Jesus. Let's crucify him. Back at the beginning of the passage that we read, it says that Caiaphas was the one that said it was expedient that one man should die for the people. They wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted it to be over. Why? Because they were so filled with envy and jealousy. Not only were they filled with envy, but they were also filled with error. This whole trial that took place, if you were to read it out and study it out, it was an illegal trial. There was nothing that was supposed to, that, of what took place, was legal for it to take place. Let me give you just a few. We know that it was at nighttime that they come and that they take Jesus. Arrests were not to be made at night. That was part of the Jewish law. The time and date of the trial were illegal because it took place at night on the eve of a Sabbath. Because it took time at that place, um, there was no time for the required adjournment till the next day in the event 
of a conviction. See, a guilty sentence could only be handed down on the day following the trial, but the next day was the Sabbath, and it was a day in which they could not do anything. So it was illegal in the sense that they took them the night before the Sabbath, and they, if it was a guilty verdict, that would have to be handed down the next day. And yet they couldn't do that because it was the day of the Sabbath. So no trial could be started on a day before the Sabbath, but yet that's what they did. The Sanhedrin, the group that was there, they were without authority to instigate and to bring charges. The Sanhedrin itself, the governing body, they could not bring charges against anyone. The charges had to come from without. But here they are the ones bringing the charges against Christ. The charges themselves against Jesus were changed during the trial. Initially, he was brought, and and, and it says that he was being charged for blasphemy based upon his statement that he would destroy the temple and rebuild the temple of God in three days, as well as his claim to be the Son of God. But then, in the middle of the trial, uh, he was brought before Pilate. The charge was that Jesus was a king and that he did not advocate paying taxes to the Roman government, and he was trying to usurp Caesar as a king. And so the charges were changed right in the middle of it. The requirement of two witnesses in agreement to merit the death penalty was not met. They brought witnesses together, but their witnesses, their their words, the Bible says, that they couldn't get on the same page, so to speak. There weren't witnesses who could actually say the same thing. He goes before Pilate, and Pilate says again and again and again, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. They never met the requirement for the death penalty. The court didn't meet in the regular meeting place of the Sanhedrin, which was required by Jewish law. Christ was not permitted a defense uh, under Jewish law. There had to be an exhaustive search of the, um, of the facts that had been presented by the witnesses, but yet that didn't happen. All this got rushed through in the middle of the night. The trial, for the most part, took place between 2 and 6 o'clock in the morning. And it just got ramrodded through. The Sanhedrin pronounced the death sentence, but under the law, they themselves said that they could put no man to death, yet they are the ones who gave a death sentence to Jesus. So we see that it was that this religious response, it was filled with an, an envy because they hated Jesus. They couldn't stand him. They wanted their own religious way. It was filled with error because they didn't care about actually doing what was right. What they cared about was getting rid of Jesus. But I want you to see that it was filled with evil too. As we look at what this religious group did, as we look at their response and what was going on, there was an evilness about it. As we look in Scripture, look at verse number 28 with me. The Bible says, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early. And they themselves, if you mark stuff in your Bible, mark this and take note of this. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. All right, don't miss this, okay? Don't miss their hypocrisy. Here they are, they have no problem bringing an innocent man, God in the flesh. They have no problem bringing him and and, and breaking all kinds of laws in which he might go and be put to death. They had no problem crucifying an innocent man. But you know what they didn't want to do? They didn't want to go into the judgment hall of the Romans there because they didn't want to defile themselves because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Do you see the hypocrisy and hear the hypocrisy and the evilness that was there in that religious system? See, the religious system was all about do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And here they are going, oh, well, it's okay if we murder an innocent man, but we're not going to defile ourselves by going into that Roman building in that Roman place. I mean, because then I can't eat the Passover tomorrow. The Passover, you say, what was, the, what was the Passover? What's the big deal? Go back a, a few thousand years, and Moses is going to bring the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt. God has told him to go, and he's told him before they go and before they leave that he's to take the, the blood of the lamb. They're to take a first-year lamb without spot or blemish. They are to shed its blood. And they were to take the blood of that lamb, and they were to 
put on the sides of the door and over the top of the door. They were to take that blood. And the Bible says that uh, about midnight, the angel of death was going to come through. And the firstborn, the oldest in that house, was going to die unless the blood post was on the door. And so the Bible says that the Israelites who took and that they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, he was going to pass over, and he passed over that home. But all the Egyptians where there was no blood, the firstborn died throughout all the land of Egypt, the Bible says. But the Passover was then celebrated every year. And it was a time of celebration and it was a time of remembering what God had done for the children of Israel there. And it was also a a picture of of the Lamb of God that was one day going to come. Do you remember all the way back? This has been all the way back at John chapter number 1 and the very beginning of John, John 1 and, and, and 2 there, where John the Baptist is out preaching and he says, Behold... The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus was the Passover Lamb who was coming, and ironically enough, the one that would be crucified on the day of Passover uh, in order to be able to take away the sin of mankind. And here they are, the religious people of the day. They're not going to go into that Roman place with those Roman people because they don't want to defile themselves because they want to eat the Passover meal. The the evilness of it, the hypocrisy of it, the religiousness of it, so to speak, is ridiculous. There's not not a better word to use. It's It's ridiculous. We can kill Jesus. That's fine. Innocent man, let's get rid of him. Let's not defile ourselves. We want to be able to eat the meal later on. We want to be super spiritual about this, okay? The hypocrisy. But that's the religious response to Jesus. Notice their heart attitude as well. Later on, after Christ has been taken, He's gone before the Sanhedrin, He's gone before Pilate. Pilate again and again says, I find no fault in Him. Skip ahead to chapter number 19. and We'll come back and talk about some more of the stuff later that took place. But look at verse number 19, or chapter 19 and verse number... 15, actually skip back to verse number 14. The Bible says it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. So it's about 12 o'clock, it's about lunchtime. And Pilate is the he that saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. Here's their heart attitude. The truth was, they didn't have a king except for Caesar. See, they didn't know Jesus Christ as king. They didn't know him as God. They didn't know him. Their heart attitude was one of, We do not have a king We only have and we only know one king, and that's Caesar. And they were exactly right in that. They were exactly right because that shows the the ultimate details when it comes to their heart attitude and the ultimate when it comes to who they served. They didn't serve God. They didn't have the Lord in their life that that they were actually serving God Almighty. He was not sitting on their heart's throne, so to speak, as the king of their life. They had a king. It was Caesar. And they followed him, and they followed the things of this world. As religious as they wanted to be, that's all they were. They were religious. And it was a religious response to Jesus. The 19th century Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard identified and talks about two kinds of religion. He labeled them religion A and religion B. He said religion A is this. Religion A is the person who goes through the motions. They go to church and they live their life, but there's never been a time where their life has been changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so they'll go through the motions and they'll go through going to church and they might be faithful to church and they might be faithful to give and they might be faithful to do and talk about God and they might be faithful to quote unquote even live their lives out for God. Nobody of Jesus' day would have looked at these Pharisees and thought, they don't know God. No, they would have thought, man, those are very spiritual people. Look at all that they do. Oh, look, they won't even defile themselves by going over and taking care. No, no, no. They, they, They looked at that as being very spiritual. But it was actually the exact opposite. It was just very religious. Religion doesn't mean you're saved. Kierkegaard goes on to talk about religion A, religion B. Religion A just has a facade of faith. There is no actual faith. There's nothing that's actually changed that person's life. But religion B is different. He said religion B is something that someone has a moment in time where they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and there is a change that takes place. There is a difference in their life and it causes them, in his words, to go on. It establishes an ongoing personal relationship between a forgiven sinner and a gracious God. And it has a definite commitment to the crucified and risen Savior. That's the difference between religion A and religion B. We would call religion B a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion A is just that. It's religion. It's what the Pharisees had. And you will respond to Jesus in the same way. Can I tell you this morning, there's a lot of people in the church, and I'm not necessarily pointing at you here, although if you fit the category, listen and pay attention. But there's a lot of people in the church and in churches who have religion A. They have, oh, well, I've always gone to church. Well, I've always been a part of that. Well, we've always been Baptist. Well, we've always grown up in this. But I read my Bible. But I spend time in prayer. But I talk to God. Oh, but I, I, you know, I bow towards this city and I do all this. And I've done all sorts of good things for other people. They have religion A. They have religion, but they don't have a relationship. And the religious response to Jesus is much like that of the Pharisees. It may not seem to be so evil, but you look at it, and it's really evil because you're still in your sins. It doesn't seem to be so much filled with error, but it's really filled with error because anything apart from the Lord Jesus Christ is error. Anything apart from salvation through Him is not salvation at all. A lot of people today living in America and all over the world have religion. They don't have a relationship. I want to ask you this morning, do you have a religion or do you have a relationship? Do you know God in general just like these people? These men of the Sanhedrin... They knew the Bible inside and out and backwards and upside down and every other way. There was nobody who knew it better than they did. There was no one who acted better on the outside than what they did. There was no one who dressed and played the part better than they did. But you know what they were? They were lost. They were religious, but they had no relationship. A religious response. Unfortunately, it can be that religion A that causes people to not come to the Lord because they think they're fine, they think they're okay, they think in their life that everything is good. And unfortunately, it's not. Unfortunately, it's not. It's part of the reason why C.S. Lewis had a great difficulty in coming to Christ. There's actually a book that was written about his conversion that was titled, The Most Reluctant Convert. Religion A had been a part of his life as a child. Religion A, that just going to church once in a while, or that just going to church at the right times, or just living the life right at the right time, so to speak, had a, had a, uh, a huge impact on his life. His mother passed away at the age of nine. 
his dad, he really lost his dad. Soon after that, his dad couldn't function, sent his, sent his two boys off to boarding school. And it was his older brother, Warren, C.S. Lewis, his older brother, Warren, that would write about how hard it was for C.S. Lewis to come to a place of trusting Christ because of the religion A that he had seen. He actually went through seeing that religion A, seeing that it did nothing for him, and he for a while became a self proclaimed atheist of sorts. And it wasn't until his, his adulthood that he actually came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But speaking about that spiritual illness, Warren, his brother, writes and says, he had a deep-seated spiritual illness, an illness that had its origins in our childhood, in the dry husk of religion offered by the semi-political church going and the similar dull emptiness of compulsory church during our school days. That learning while he was young, learning how to just have a religion, made it extremely hard for him to actually come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this morning, what do you have in your life? What do your children see and know you to have? Do you have religion or do you have a relationship? It's important to know and to know the difference. There was a religious response, but then second of all, we'll see what I'm going to call here a, a reasonable response. I mean, the, the world will look at this response and they'll say, oh, well, well, that was a reasonable response. And what we're going to see here is we're going to look at Pilate and we're going to look at his life here for just a moment and see what I believe the world would call a reasonable response to Christ. Notice that as we back up a little bit and Pilate comes into our story John chapter number 18, the Bible says in verse 28 that they led him, that they're going to take him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him in verse 29, what accusations do you bring against this man? Uh, there was not a good relationship between Pilate and the Jews. Uh, but they went back and forth at each other quite a bit. Um, and, and they tell him, well, if he weren't a malefactor, we wouldn't have brought him to you. And so Pilate hammers back, and well, then take you if he's so bad, take him and, and judge him according to your own law. And they said, well, we can't do that because we can't put anybody to death. Pilate takes him and starts to question Jesus. He asks him, he says, art thou a king? In other portions of Scripture, we see that Jesus says, thou sayest it. In other words, Jesus confirms what's being said about him. I want you to see something that, and we're going to look at a couple of other passages here in the other Gospels for a moment about Pilate and some things in Pilate's life here with Jesus. I want you to notice that Pilate, the reasonable response is what we're calling it to Jesus. He was greatly intrigued by Jesus. In Mark chapter 15, I want you to listen to some verses here, verses 2 through 5. Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered, he said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. He was greatly intrigued with this man that stood before him, this man, Jesus. He was greatly intrigued by what the Jews were trying to do. He knew it was for envy that the Jews were bringing Jesus to, to, to be put on trial here. He knew what was behind the Jews' hearts and their method for why they had brought him. And so here he is, and he's, great, he's really intrigued by this man, and he sees him. An another man that we could say was intrigued as well uh, was Herod. The Bible says that Pilate sends him, when he finds out he's from Galilee, he sends him over to Herod, and, and Herod says, oh, he starts rubbing his hands together. N not literally, okay, but he starts rubbing his hands together. He's like, oh, good. He's like, I was hoping to see some miracle done by him. I've heard about this guy, but Jesus wouldn't say a word, and so Herod just sends him back to Pilate. Pilate hears about Jesus, and he hears Jesus say that his kingdom is not of this world. He hears them accuse him of being the Son of God, and he's like, whoa, wait a second. Okay, I better, I better check this thing out a little bit. I mean, he was greatly intrigued by this man Jesus that was in front of him. And he was interested enough to, to ask some questions, and to, he was interested enough to try to figure out what was going on. He came to a conclusion of, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him at all. His great intrigue brought him to a place of good intentions. Uh, in Luke chapter 23, 
I want you to listen to these verses in Luke 23, verses 13 through 16. It says, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things wherever ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod. For I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Now notice this. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. He had good intentions as far as Jesus was concerned. He was willing to let him go. I don't find any fault in this man. And then when he hears, wait, wait, he says he's the son of God. He says he's come from above. Well, we, we better be careful. His own wife comes to him and says, Pilate, I have had a dream. You better leave this guy alone. I've had some crazy nightmares and some crazy vision about what's going on there. You need to leave him alone. And Pilate says, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to let him go. He has good intentions, so to speak, when it came to Jesus. But I want you to notice this, he was, he was also, although he was greatly intrigued and although he had some good intentions, he was greedily impartial. At the end of the day, what I mean by that, he didn't really care about the people and he didn't really care about Jesus. You know who Pilate cared about? Himself. Himself. Look with me, Mark chapter number 15. The Bible says, And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. You see, the, the, the people were starting an uproar, and it wasn't that Pilate really cared about what the Jews wanted. He just didn't want an uproar, and he didn't want there to be any more conflict between them. So to appease the people, he releases Barabbas, and he sends Jesus to be crucified. In John chapter 19, in verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, uh, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought forth Jesus and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Then delivered he, verse number 16, Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. You know what Pilate cared about? He cared about himself. He cared about, oh, oh, well, well I, don't, I, don't want the, I don't want this uprising over here. Let's just appease the people. Oh, wait, if you, if you don't care about uh, crucifying this guy, then you're against Caesar. Oh, I don't want anybody to think I'm against Caesar. I don't want anybody coming after me. I mean, I, I, I've got this position here. I'm walking on pins and needles as it is after some of the other things that have happened. I don't want anybody coming after my job. I don't want anybody coming after my life. I just want to just do what I need to do. He was greedily impartial, didn't really care about Jesus, didn't really care about the people. He really cared about himself. Most of the world will look at that kind of response to Jesus and say, well, well, that's a reasonable response to have. I mean, you check something out and you, and you look at it, you look at this, this person who makes these claims and you have good intentions, but you know what? Take care of you and make sure that you're okay. Take care of your life and do what's best for you. Take care of your life and make sure that you are number one. That's, the world has no problem saying that. Most people would say, oh, that's a, that was a reasonable response. I mean, after all, Pilate, I mean, you didn't want to lose your job. You got your family to think of, and, and I mean, you've, you, you've got, you know, you're trying to run, and you, there's a bunch of people that you're having to deal with. You're just trying to appease everybody and do what's best. I mean, that was a reasonable response. That's what the world would look at and say. How many of you, and, and Pilate, Pilate, basically, what he ends up saying is, you know, I, I tried. I tried, okay? It was a, I gave it a shot. Matthew 27, verse 24, the Bible says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather atonement was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Pilate says, okay, you know what? Bring me, bring me some water over here. This is a just man that you're crucifying and that you're killing. I just want you to know I take no part in it. I don't want to have anything to do with it at all. You go ahead and you see to it. You go, go ahead and go crucify him. I'll let Barabbas go. You take Jesus crucified. But I'm not having any part of it. A reasonable response, right? How many of you know people that have a quote-unquote reasonable response to the things of the Lord? See, here's the thing. Actions not intentions will bear out our true belief. Actions, not intentions. Pilate may have had the best intentions in the world. 
He may have had good intentions to release Jesus and let him go. He may have had good intentions about allowing him and trying to do something. And he may have had good intentions about what he wanted for the... But, but at the end of the day, it was his actions that portrayed who he was. The reasonable response person is the one who ultimately cares more about themselves than they do about Christ or about living for the Lord. Have you ever heard someone say this? If I follow Christ or if I become a believer, I'll have to give up and then name something. Oh, but, it, but if I become a follower of Jesus, then these people aren't going to be my friends. If I become a follower of Christ, if I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, people are going to think that I have been a fake or a phony. Or if I, put, if I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then people are going to look at me differently. My family's not going to accept me. My, my work, I might lose my job if I start to, if I'm a Christian, if I'm a believer and I live out my faith. If I were to do that, and they give a bunch of reasons as to why they can't. It's Pilate. It's Pilate. Oh, oh, well, that's a reasonable response. We understand that's a, it's a little too much to ask you to go that far. I wash my hands of it. I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm not really putting him on the cross here. I'm going to wash my hands of it. I'm taking care of me and myself here. I'm just going to step back and stay out of it. The person that says, if I follow Christ, I'll have to give this up. They don't really understand eternal life. They don't really understand who Christ is. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're here today and you do not have a relationship with Him, it does not matter what is in your life or what your past is or what life you may have lived. There is nothing, there is nothing worth losing eternal life over. Amen. Nothing. The Bible says, what shall it gain a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What would it matter this morning if all the wealth and all the friendships and all the everything in the world, what if it was all yours and sitting at your doorstep and all you had to do was take it and say, oh, here's all the wealth, here's everything I ever imagined. What would it matter? If you went out tomorrow and were in a car wreck and you died without the Lord Jesus Christ and spent an eternity in hell, what would it matter? The answer is it wouldn't. It wouldn't matter. No, not all the wealth, not all the friendships, not all the anything in the world is worth losing your eternal life for. Pilate, oh, I wash my hands of this. Maybe had good intentions, but to the best of our knowledge, he never came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had an opportunity to know truth, to know the one who is truth. The Bible says, Jesus saith unto them, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But when Jesus said, I have come to bear truth, Pilate scoffed and says, what is truth? He was looking at truth. He was in the presence of truth. He had the opportunity to know truth and to know eternal life. And he just had a reasonable response. Ah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really think that's important right now. That's not as important as me in my life at this time. You can have a religious response. You can have a reasonable response, at least according to what the world might say. Or, as we finish this morning, you can have a redemptive response. A redemptive response. Look with me, the passage in Luke chapter number 23. It's not mentioned here in our passage in John but in Luke chapter number 23, beginning in verse number 39, the Bible says, And one of the malefactors, remember there were two that were, hang, that were hanged and on either side and that were crucified on either side of Christ. It says, One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou came, comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Here's the redemptive response, and it's the one of the thief on the cross. 
So here this man is. He's being crucified next to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's literally breathing his dying breaths. And with some of his dying breaths, he says to the Lord, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You know what he was doing? He was acknowledging who Jesus was. As the Roman centurion at the foot of the cross said, Surely this must be the Son of God. Here this thief on the cross recognizes this is the Son of God. This is God in the flesh. This is, this is the one who has come to take away the sin of the world. He says, Lord, I, I acknowledge that you are the sovereign Lord over all. He acknowledges that one day Christ will have a kingdom. He acknowledges who he is and he says, simply, Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? By the way, I want to say this morning, salvation is not in a prayer. It's not in a, in, oh, I said these right words just the right way. Salvation is faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everybody says the exact same words at salvation. I believe there are things we need to know about Jesus Christ and there are things that we need to believe the Bible is clear in that that we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God we must believe that he was God in the flesh we must believe in who he was and what he did we have to know that we're a sinner that we're guilty of death because of sin death is always separation and because of our sin we deserve death we deserve uh, eternal death away and apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and apart from God but Jesus Christ came as God in the flesh, lived a perfect life, died and shed His blood on the cross to cover and to pay for my sin. He was buried and He rose again the third day, conquering sin and the, and the grave so that we could know that we can have eternal life through Him. And the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it may not be that you said the exact same words that somebody else did, but salvation is not in a prayer and in specific words that you say salvation comes by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to do for you what you could not do for yourself. And here the thief on the cross says just a few words, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. And let me say, you're always in the right place when you're with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You're always in the right place when you're with Him. And the thief dies there on the cross in just a few short moments, but his eternal soul goes to be with the Lord there in paradise that day. And that's a wonderful truth that we see. You can have a redemptive response. There is no one in this room that is at a place where you have to say, well, you know what, I, I, I just I don't know if the Lord would save me. No, 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 if He'll save the dying thief on the cross, if He'll save him in his few last breaths as before he goes, if you have a desire to come to the Lord and to trust Him, if the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to your life about your need of a Savior, if you're sitting here right now, I don't care if you've been sitting here, uh, if this is your first time or if it's your 1,000th and first time or, or 10,000th time of sitting in a church building, Building, I, it doesn't matter. What matters is do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? What have you done with the King? What have you done with Jesus? In 1799, Conrad Reed discovered a 17-pound rock while he was fishing in Little Meadow Creek there on his farm in North Carolina. He took it and, and took it to his parents and, and showed them this really cool rock that he found. And so they started, they let him keep the rock and they're like, okay, you can keep it. And they allowed him to use it and, and, and the family began to use it as a doorstop. When they needed to hold open a the door, they needed to do something there in the home, they would take this rock and they'd use this big old 17-pound rock uh, to hold open the door. Three years went by. And in 1802, his father, John Reed, took the rock to a jeweler in Fayetteville, North Carolina, who determined that it was a solid lump of gold that at the time was worth about $3,600. You think, eh, $3,600, that's not that much. In today's money value, it'd be worth more than half a million dollars. I don't know if that would change your life or not. It would change mine. Um, and there they had been using a gold nugget, 17-pound gold nugget, to hold open a door. It was a doorstop. The lump of gold uh, was 
determined to be one of the biggest gold nuggets that had ever been found east of the Rockies. They ended up turning that farm, they began working it, and they began to uh, work during the time um, of planting and harvest. They would do all of that stuff on the farm still, but then in the off time, they would begin to pan for gold. And it ended up becoming a, a, a huge uh, gold mine and uh, one, of the, one of the largest uh, gold nuggets to be found later that year. They found another one weighing some 28 pounds there on the property. Uh, the father, John Reed, died at 88 years of age, a very, very wealthy man. You can still go to North Carolina and around that area today, and there's still the mines that are there. You can go and do tours and things of that nature, and, and you can do and have, uh, you can pan for gold at certain times and, and go through and, and take tours of the underground cabins and all where they did some mining and everything there years ago. There have been millions and millions and millions of dollars that have come out of those gold mines because um, of, of, of all the, the searching and the looking and the finding. But it started with one great big old gold nugget that was pulled out of a creek, and they really didn't have any idea what its value was and what it was worth. Truth is, a lot of people have done the same thing with the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they, they do not see the value of who He is and what He is worth in their lives. If you're here this morning, and forgive the analogy, but I pray that you're not using Jesus as a doorstop. I pray this morning that you're not just using Jesus as a doorstop in life of, of oh, well, when I need Him, I'll, I'll pull Him out over here. Oh, well, when I need Him, I, you know, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just use God when I need Him in life. No, no, no. I, I hope you haven't had in your life just a religious response to Jesus. I hope you're not one that you just have a reasonable response that, you know, well, you know, someday maybe, but, you know, for right now I'm just trying to take care of me and take care of my life and make sure that things go okay for me. I hope you're not trusting in as the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the religious elites today. I hope you're not just trusting in the good things that you do or, 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 the, or the people that you've helped or the church that you go to or how long you've been reading your Bible or any of those things. I hope you know today that you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as simple as being the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's as simple as starting a relationship with Him. Do you have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ today? I hope that you do, and I hope that you'll know today, before we're done, before you walk out of those doors, I hope you know where you're spending eternity, and it will all be based on